to know you in all of your glory, to love you with all that I am, with all of my heart, Lord, this is my prayer, to know Good morning, beloved people of God, and welcome to worship. My name is Adam Woods. I'm the pastor here at Parkview United Methodist Church in Turtle Lake, Wisconsin, and we are so glad you are joining us today for worship. As we gather for worship today, we gather in the name of Christ, and even though we gather through, once again, digital means and internet videos and staying socially distanced with one another, we still gather as the people of God. So let us join together in our opening prayer. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord, our God, we come to you today. We come to this time of worship expecting and excited to hear your word proclaimed, to experience your grace and your presence anew, and to be transformed and guided, molded and made to be your disciples. Oh, Lord, we ask that you be with us that you be at move among us in this time of worship today. In the name of Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen.
Genesis 1, verses 3 through 4a. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. Psalm chapter 29, verses 8a, 9a, and 11b. The voices of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The voice of the Lord causes the oaks to whirl. May the Lord bless his people with peace. A reading from Acts 19, verse 6. When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Mark 1, verse 4. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Mark 1 verse 5 And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Mark 1, verse 7. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. Mark 1, 8. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Mark 1, 9. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Mark 1, verse 10. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. Mark 1, verse 11. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. Today's scripture lesson and preaching text comes from Acts chapter 18, verse 24 through chapter 19, verse 7. Now there came to Ephesus a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria. He was an eloquent man, well versed in the scriptures. 
He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with burning enthusiasm and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained the way of God to him more accurately. And when he wished to cross over to Achia, the believers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. On his arrival, he greatly helped those who through grace had become believers, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Messiah is Jesus. When Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the interior regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They replied, No. We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then he said, Into what then were you baptized? They answered, Into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them. And they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, they were about twelve of them. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Beloved people of God, would you pray with me? Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Amen. I'm going rogue today, my friends. The lectionary passage from Acts for this Sunday doesn't officially begin until chapter 19 with verse 1, but I've included the final verses of chapter 18 to make sure we appreciate the context and complexity of the assigned passage. Okay, so maybe saying rogue is a bit overstatement, but I do want to emphasize that there is a lot to glean from this passage today for a church day that we call Baptism of the Lord Sunday, and the first Sunday in the church season of Epiphany, which is our next church season this year. But there is also not only a lot to say in this relatively short passage to us on this important day in worship, but there's also a lot that we can seek from the Holy Scriptures as we gather for worship after such a tumultuous week. Wednesday was a day that will be etched in our individual and collective national consciousness and memories for a long time to come due to what occurred at our nation's capital. Occurrence made even more troubling because last Wednesday was also the day in the Christian church calendar where we celebrate the epiphany, when we celebrate the light, the life, the appearance of God in our world through the Christ child and the wise men from the east who come to greet him. What a contrast between the joy of the church holiday and the realities we saw unfolding in Washington, D.C. The word epiphany comes from the Greek word epiphania, which is best translated into English as something like manifestation or appearing. That means from now until Transfiguration Sunday, which will be right before Ash Wednesday in February, we're in this church season during which we consider the various ways God is manifest among us. God appears to us. We're in the season of Epiphany now, my friends. And recounting the baptism of the Lord on this first Sunday of a season dedicated to seeing how God appears and bursts forth is especially fitting. 
and hearing the word of God through the words of Acts chapter 18 and 19 after the events of this past week are especially fitting as well. What today is all about, what this season of Epiphany is fundamentally about, what this scripture passage from Acts draws our attention to, is not about us or our abilities or our power. It's instead about the appearance of God through what God gives to us. Now, of course, for Christians, the primary gift is God's own self in the form of Christ our Lord, who embodied and taught us the way, the truth, and the life of the people of God. But another important gift that the baptism of the Lord brings is just that, Christ's own baptism, and baptism in the name of Christ. Now, the New Testament does speak of two baptisms. The first is the baptism of John the Baptist, which is a sign of human repentance and cleansing. And the second baptism is in the name of Jesus that bestows upon us an unimaginable and amazing gift. And our passage from Acts today mentions both of these forms. Acts chapter 18 ends with the disciple Priscilla and her husband Aquila sharing the powerful with the powerful preacher and effective orator, Apollos, the part of the faith that he is missing. Apollos may have a, a burning enthusiasm and an accurate teaching and understanding concerning Jesus, but he knew only of the baptism of John. Acts chapter 19 begins as Paul finds the small band of Christ followers in Ephesus who had been led by Apollos and baptized in the baptism of John. And Paul then asks them about their personal experience with the Holy Spirit. He asks, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? To which this small group of Ephesian Christians reply, no, we have not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. And Paul follows up with, and to what then were you baptized? Into John's baptism, these early Ephesian Christians reply. And Paul then reveals and reminds and reinterprets for them the following. He says, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. Paul explains that they learned from Apollos was the importance of repentance and for asking for God to forgive us of all the ways that we have harmed ourselves, our neighbors, and our connection with God. And on hearing this, they were baptized into the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then after Paul lays his hands on them, the Holy Spirit comes upon them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. And when we come to this final verse, our minds likely go to the ways that the Pentecostal movement over the last hundred years has defined speaking in tongues. And likewise, our minds connect that word prophesy, prophecy, to future predictions. But tongues and prophecy are so much more than that. In the world of the Bible, prophecy was speaking the hard truth of God's ways to a world that didn't want to hear it. Prophecy is naming and proclaiming the ways God appears and is manifest in places that we don't expect God to be, or sometimes we don't even want God to shine a light into. The immediate gift bestowed upon the Ephesian disciples, whom Paul baptizes, is that they can now speak in ways they never could before, and they can now speak in God's name on behalf of God's work in the world here and now. To be able to see the truth of Christ, to be able to recognize the ways of God, to be able to speak to the world the reality of God's call and purpose, these are all a gift we receive, and one that is bestowed upon us through the Holy Spirit. Friends, nothing changed in the Bible this past week. The words that I read from Acts 18 and 19 on Tuesday when I first sat down to prepare the ground for this sermon are the same words I read on Thursday as I prepared to write the initial draft. All the world, all the words remained the same. Yet at the same time, so much of what many had thought and believed and understood about ourselves as a nation and as a world has changed. 
As the violent confrontation with police unfolded, as extremists successfully overtook the United States Capitol building, it was like scales fell from our eyes as a nation. We saw through our social media feeds and on the cable news coverage on our televisions, the anger and the, the rage that had been part of our national story for quite a while now. Perhaps most troubling, we saw among that crowd t-shirts and signs referring to the Holocaust, things that read, six million wasn't enough. Among the coverage, the videos we saw, we saw a crudely erected noose and platform that closely resembled the thousands of nooses that lynched black Americans for the decades after the Civil War. Very clearly, our nation has deep and dangerous divisions right now. At the same time, we as a church also have to sit with and consider what to do with the fact that among the images from Wednesday, we saw an oversized wooden cross erected on the breach to Capitol grounds. We heard in interviews from those participating in the protest and even participating in the forced entry into the Capitol that they were driven by their faith in God and directed by their Christian beliefs and values. You can disagree with those who are part of the events in Washington, and you can vehemently disagree with their claim that they rightly represent Christianity and Christ's way and truth and life, but nevertheless, we have to wrestle with their claim that they are part of the body as, of Christ as well. Friends, that's a hard thing to do. Oftentimes when things happen, like the violence of this past week, we like to say that, well, we can be reconciled. There can be love and unity. That's all we need. And that is true. But that's not as easy as it sounds. Because true love and true unity require repentance. Perhaps that is something else we learn from the baptisms presented by Apollos and then Paul. When we live into our baptisms, we choose repentance. We choose turning aside from what we have done wrong. And that can only happen when we actually are able to sit down with ourselves, to sit with our sin and our shame and our history long enough to grapple with what actually was sinful in the first place. Repentance can only begin. Love can only redeem and unite when hard truths are spoken aloud and faced, which is hard, and which most of humanity will resist speaking these things and they'll resist it with all that we are. Civil rights activist James Baldwin once said, I imagine one of the reasons people cling to their hate so stubbornly is because they sense once hate is gone, they will be forced to deal with pain. On this Sunday, after this week when such hate and division were on display, we all must face our past and seek a truer understanding of our present with our eyes open and our hearts open. To see the insidious nature of the sin of white supremacy, of the rage of racism and anti-Semitism on full display, and see how it reverberates across our country, we have to look also within ourselves. I know those images from Wednesday are painful to watch. And I know how hard it is to even talk about such a polarizing and extreme event. But beloved people of God, we have been given the gift to see clearly and speak prophetically about God's work in the midst of division. Through the gift of baptism, we realize and embrace God's claim upon us. Through the gift of baptism, we receive the power to speak the truth, the grace, the peace, the justice, the love of God. As we go forth into the season of Epiphany, let us be on the lookout for how God appears to us, manifests among us. As we go forth into this time of national grieving and trauma, shock and division, let us not be surprised by the ways the Holy Spirit will lead us, and I mean us as individuals as well, to speak in God's name on behalf of God's work in the world here and now. Glory and thanks be to God who is with us, God who is among us. Amen.
Beloved people of God, would you join me in the prayers of the people? Guided by Christ made known to the nations, let us lift up our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. For the church throughout the world and its leaders, that guided by the Holy Spirit, they proclaim the forgiveness of sins. Let us pray, have mercy, O God for wilderness and water, wind and wild beasts, and all living things on earth, that God's goodness is revealed through creation and faithful stewards care for all God has made. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For the nations and the world and all the leaders, for laborers busy both day and night, and for peacemakers amend strife, we pray that God inspire all people to use their strength wisely. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For the sick and those who provide medical care. For the imprisoned and those who show them mercy. For the lonely and those who provide companionship. For all who suffer. We pray that God shower them with compassion. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For the congregation who gathers with us, for students returning to school, for those seeking renewal in their daily work, we pray that all the beloved of God experience grace and peace. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. In thanksgiving for the fruitful departed, for the faithful departed who now rest from their labors, that their witness inspire us in our baptismal vocations. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
Friends, we now turn to the time of the offering of our gifts and ourselves. I invite you to take a moment to consider the ways that God is calling you specifically to be prophetic in this world. What is God calling you to give of your time, talents, gifts, and resources so you can proclaim God's work, and God's activity, and God's will, and God's grace in the here and the now? Take a moment Consider the ways God is calling you to offer your gifts and yourselves. And the silence will be broken in a moment with the words of our doxology. Beloved people of God, as you prepare to go forth, I invite you to take this week and to consider all the ways that we have been given grace through our baptism, all the ways that God has given us so many powers, so many ways of speaking truth and grace and love into this world that needs to hear these messages so much. Let us end with a reaffirmation of our baptism found in our red hymnal. I invite you, if you are watching this through a video, you are welcome to pause the video right now, and you can go and find a bowl of water yourself. And as I lift up water from our baptismal font, you at home can do this as well. This isn't a rebaptism; This is a reaffirmation of our baptismal identity, promises, and covenant. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you all, do we renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of our sin? Let us all say we do. Do we accept the freedom and power God gives us, to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Let us all say with a pure heart, we will. Do we confess Jesus Christ as our Savior, put our whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as our Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? Let us say to that, we will. And according to the grace given to us, will we, will we remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? Let our prayer always be, we will. Friends, I invite you to go forth in the name of Christ our Lord, in the name of the God who created us and sustains us and redeems us, the one who is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, bless and keep you, and may God's face shine upon you and give you Don't 
feel good right now and I know you think of things I could never think about it's hard to count it all joy distracted by the noise trying to make sense